On August 30th, 1861, Union General John C. Fremont in Missouri made a proclamation that any captured property of Confederate sympathizers, including slaves, would be liberated and freed. This created, of course, a lot of concern in the state of Kentucky, a state that had a southern supporting governor, but a union supporting legislator. Illinois Senator wrote to Abraham Lincoln. That senator was Senator Orville Browning, longtime friend of the president. Lincoln responded on September 22nd in a letter in which he wrote, I think to lose Kentucky is to lose the whole game. We cannot hold on to Missouri, nor, as I think, Maryland. Kentucky is going to be key. Kentucky lost means losing the whole game. Key of Kentucky is going to happen at one major battle, the major battle for Kentucky, the battle at Perryville. This is where I'm at, Perryville Battlefield Park. And this is Civil War Journal. God. The Confederacy is in trouble in the West. General Ulysses S. Grant's victories at Fort Henry, Fort Donelson, Shiloh, Don Carlos Buell's movements in Tennessee around Chattanooga, and the capture of the Tennessee capital of Nashville has put a real scare in the Confederacy. Desperate Braxton Bragg gets with Kirby Smith to create an invasion of Kentucky to alleviate the bleeding that is happening in this Western campaign. Bragg decides to go into Kentucky for several reasons. One, he believes that once a Confederate army is in there, Confederate sympathizers will join him and join him in force. Two, it will alleviate Union pressures in the Deep South. And three, if things go really well for Bragg, he can take river towns along the Ohio River, putting some economic hardships into the Union. This is going to be a key battle. In the fall of 1862, Kentucky is in a mist of a historic drought. Troops from both sides are desperate in finding water and searching the bluegrass hills. Some are even taking water from livestock troughs. There is news that the town of Perryville has some water in the nearby creeks. Both Braxton Bragg's army, along with Don Carlos Buell's army, make their way towards the town in search of this water. Buell had split his divisions into three equal divisions of about 20,000 branches, 20,000 men in each branch. Braxton Bragg, who came into the Commonwealth with 27, 28,000 is now at Perryville with only 17 because he's been splintering off troops trying to protect roads and his supplies. With the rumors of water coming at Perryville on the October 8th, 1862, the two sides meet by accident and desperation. Don Carlos Buell outnumbered Braxton Bragg three to one out of his 60,000 troops, he's only going to engage 20,000, mainly due to the fact that he believes he's not in combat. He does not hear the guns on that first bit of firing on October 8th in the morning. Uh, just doesn't hear it. The hills of the Kentucky bluegrass hide those echoes. I am here at Parsons Ridge. This is where some of the first action at Perryville is going to take place. Leonidas Polk and his divisions are over there. He's sending in his first bit of waves coming up this hill right here. Uh, upon his assault, uh, one of his officers, General Cheatham, says, Boys, 
give him hell. Now, Leonidas Polk, who had been an Episcopal bishop uh, prior to the war, not wanting to use the same word, said, boys, do what he said, pretty much. The, the, the fight that came up here, the Confederates overtook this first hill, and as they were overtaking this hill, uh, a group of Ohio boys were along this line over this way, trying to defend, but Polk had brought a weight of surrounding it over and eventually causing the entire Union line to collapse back over to this ridge right over here. As Union forces are being overrun by that ridge and coming down, trying to make their way to this next ridge over here, as, and as the Confederates are coming down towards them, a group of Union soldiers are in this cornfield, the 21st Wisconsin. They are in one of the lowest valley points, and they're in trouble, and they don't know it yet. The poor 21st Wisconsin will be overran by Confederates, and as they are trying to escape, leaving that cornfield, they then come straight into Union lines that are at that fence right over here. Because the corn was so tall at the beginning of October, that Union line had no clue who was coming out of this cornfield. They opened fire at point blank range into the 21st Wisconsin. Now, the 21st Wisconsin, which had been taken attack from the Confederates in the entrance of the cornfield, as they were exiting, they're now getting shot point blank by their own men. And these are brand new guys. A number of them had never even fired their muskets before. Union Colonel John Starkweather is up on this ridge. He's watched the Union lines fall from that ridge over there, retreating through the cornfield. He's watched the Wisconsin boys get completely wiped out. He's watching the Confederates come up this way. At the same time, he's seen the Confederate artillery line being developed and deployed over there. He's getting fired from artillery over here and here. And now it's a bit of desperation. If he falls, it could be the end of the Union line. So he has to hold it for a little bit. And that is what Colonel Starkweather does. Once he realizes the majority of Union troops have retreated on further into safety, he then, not having any horses left to move his cannons, because they were all shot down by the Confederates, uh, finds whatever remaining Union soldiers that were still in retreat to literally drag these cannons up and down these bluegrass hills to say, being a true hero of a day. Because of it, this hill here was named after him, and that is Starkweather's Hill. As the first Tennessee made their way up to Starkweather's Hill, the action became so intense it was hand-to-hand -hand act combat. It was so bloody in this hand-to-hand -hand combat that soldiers were literally slipping in all the amount of blood that was on the ground here at this hill. Private Sam Watkins of the Confederacy would later write on, fighting I've never had seen before since. The Iron Storm passed through our ranks, mangling and tearing men to pieces. At the Battle of Perryville, Private Watkins would find that both his hat and his cartridge box had been holed by enemy fire. He was truly lucky at Perryville. The Battle of Perryville has a front that lasts several miles long. And about two miles from here is where Bill Sheridan, who is has a reputation of being extremely aggressive, makes a brilliant defensive stand on one of the hills, but then just stops and watches the rest of the battle without doing anything. And he's received some criticism for not engaging because Phil Sheridan is, again, an aggressive general. Uh, he's going to help Grant pursue Robert E. Lee at the end of the war. Uh, after the Civil War is over, he is going to be given command of the entire U.S. Army and he's going to be the leader uh, for the U.S. Army in the pursuit of uh, the Indian Wars. He's also the guy that has been credited for saying the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Uh, and Phil Sheridan was somebody who is not necessarily 
uh, a good example of love. That being said, though, does Sheridan deserve the criticism he has there at the Ridge? Well, he had just gotten scolded by his superior officer, uh, General Gilbert. General Gilbert is having lunch with Don Carlos Buell several miles that way. They don't even know that the fighting's going on. When Gilbert and Buell hear that there is some cannon fire, they believe it's just Sheridan testing his fire. Uh, so they send a message, pretty much a scolding, for him to stop wasting ammunition and quit doing it. So Sheridan did specifically that. Once he managed to hold his line, after getting scolded by his superior officer who didn't have much military training prior to him, uh, he does what he's supposed to do and he does not engage. Again, Kentucky is in a massive drought, so all of this combat is going to generate a lot of dust. And all of these cannons that are going to be firing, uh, they're going to generate a lot of smoke. But to give Don Carlos Buell at least a little bit of the benefit of the doubt is this. The smoke is going to be blown in a different direction than where he's having lunch at. The hills that are all around this area are going to dampen. So that is the reason why Don Carlos Buell only engages 20 of his 60,000 men. At the end of October 8th, when he's come to understand what is going on, he's going to be able to regroup all of his men and have 60,000 men ready. At the end of the 8th, men came to this little valley to try to find some solace and sanctuary, both Confederates and Union soldiers who were wounded, dying, crying for their moms, for their wives, for their family. And as night falls, and these guys are laying down in this valley, wild Kentucky pigs come roaming around through the hills, eating some of those wounded alive. Braxton Bragg realizes the battle is lost. Although he made a tactical victory and was beating the uh, Union lines, he doesn't have the men to hold. The thousands of Confederates, sympathizers that he was hoping that Kentucky would bring him, they're just like this empty hill. It's a no-show. He is forced to retreat and thus give Kentucky back to the Union. The casualties are staggering. Over 4,200 for the Union, over 3,400 for the Confederacy. Percentage-wise, it's decimating, especially considering the amount of the men that were engaged on both sides. Braxton Bragg retreats first to Harrodsburg and then onto the Cumberland Gap and then out of Kentucky. Don Carlos Buell, though, does not take the Union line and pursue. It seemed that it was a useless pursuit. For that, he will be removed from command and he will spend about a year and a half in litigation and then finally retires from the Army. The Union Army is then given to William Rosencrantz. Bragg, upon return back to the Confederacy in Tennessee, is called to meet with Jefferson Davis in Richmond. One reason why is most of Bragg's officers were not pleased with the way he handled the Kentucky campaign and its failure. Jefferson Davis will remain loyal to his long friend Braxton Bragg and does not remove him from command, but the damage is done. Bragg will not be going back to his men in full confidence. Instead, he will have division between his fellow officers for the remainder of the war. Perryville, along with Antietam in the end of 1862, are the two victories that the Union desperately needed. And President Lincoln will be using these victories, even though they were Confederate victories that sort of got screwed up. Um, Lincoln will use these victories as a way to release his Emancipation
proclamation forever changing the war. With the high casualties that were left on the battlefield of Perryville, most of the Union soldiers will be sent to national cemeteries, including Cave Hill and Louisville. The Confederate, though, they were pretty much, a lot of them were left where they lay. Some will be buried by family members. Others will be buried by local farmers who put them in a mass burial, such as this one that is here at Perryville, where approximately 200 Confederate soldiers lay in their final resting place. Perryville is a bloody conflict. The numbers are astounding. The percentage is high. Private Sam Watkins of 1st Tennessee finished his thoughts on Perryville with this. I was in every battle, skirmish, and march that was made by the 1st Tennessee Regiment during the war, and I do not remember of a harder contest or more evenly fought battle than that of Perryville. If it had been two men wrestling, it would have been called a dogfall. Both sides claimed victory. Both sides whipped. All right, fellas, want some extra credit? Well, go to Perryville Battlefield Park with your family and you can get some. Uh, it was really easy to get there. It's 70 miles to 80 miles somewhere, depending on where you're at in Louisville, maybe a little bit less. I went via Taylorsville Road. There's all sorts of ways to get there, but uh, this one was a scenic way. You go right by Taylorsville Lake. You go through numerous small communities and it was very picturesque. Sunday drive in essence. Uh, do make sure though that you load up on gas before you go because it is rural and there is not many opportunities to get gas along the way. When you get to the park you will find that there is a very well put together museum. Uh, the museum has a very small admission to it uh, and there are great exhibits of the battle as well as just prior and after and some items uh, that are available for sale at the gift store so that's uh perryville battlefield park uh yeah. so you're the, the, the age of my students you're a yeah. rising junior at your high school green county yes green county high school green county high school which was rivals of my first year teaching marion well, county high school times. um <laughs> So, out of curiosity, yeah. uh, you know, I'm asking my guys, you know, to consider driving 90 minutes to come visit this battlefield park. Um, you being their age, why? Why should they come down to Perryville Battlefield Park? You know, it's very simple. It's because if you want to understand of how we get here in our world right now, present day, you have to understand our past. You know, why is it that Perryville matters? It's it's a huge story that impacted millions of lives, if you can believe it. Uh, we had in a span of about five hours, 8,000 casualties near around there. And those are 8,000 families that were affected for the rest of their lives. Um, and there are many great stories of heroic deeds that were here at the Battle of Perryville. Um, if you're wanting to understand of, you know, maybe how, if you want to, you could also research your ancestor. I know that there was the 15th Kentucky was raised out of Louisville and they fought here at Perryville. Um, and their story matters. Uh, there was an account uh, to kind of summarize it up from a Union general, I believe it was General Lebel Rousseau, who is a Louisville native, who said that, you know, I was at the Battle of Shiloh, and yet Perryville matters more than that. It, it's sort of, sort of around there. But he said that Perryville mm -hmm. was a very hard fought fight that he did. It was, if you read the accounts, most Confederate and Federals will even say that this place was one of the hardest fought battles that they did, and this, they served throughout the entire Civil War. Well, Sam Watkins, who has a famous journal, oh, yes. Uh, yes, writes uh, that uh, that this was his, out of all the engagements, and he, he was at a who's who <laughs> Every, kind of major battle in the West. Uh, he was like, this is was the grittiest of them all. Yeah, and, and I, I'd say, you know, just come out here. You could easily figure out why this place matters. I'm just looking around the terrain and the heat. You know, we experienced a little bit of that today, but. Definitely. So there you go, guys. Uh, from the words of a classmate of your age kind of thing, uh, Taylor has put it in pretty simple. It just matters because it's 
Uh, it's an important story yeah, it for has us an to impact for Kentucky. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. So, as always, fellas, thanks for being a part of this class. Remain awesome. Be nice. Stay safe, and I will see you soon.